organized in Rhode Island, and their mission is to give free poetry to people. And so you can submit poems, and they, they turn them into little micro chapbooks. And there's a piece of art with it. And so they published some of, some of my poems, and so I printed a bunch of mine off and theirs off and folded them. And so they're here so that you can have free poems. And I also had some extra broadsides at home, and so I put some of those up here too, if you would like them, okay? <laughs> and I would like to start my reading with a quote, and then I want to end my reading with a quote, too. And my quote is from Theodore Rotke, and I think this is a lovely metaphor that explains existence. And he said in a poem, this shaking keeps me steady. My first poem, I'm going to read some poems about people and then some odes to nature. The first poem is titled, my daughter walks the plank for Anna. Late night after the party, after the small hors d'oeuvres of chatter, zany wits, the feasts of laughter, we lean on counters in our now clean kitchen. I watch her face as she explains love and a boy and her reasons. She walks the plank of teetering logic with caution, then wanders back, explaining again. Devoted, I notice her eyes puffed with emotion, but clear, and on occasion, flashing bright searchlights in my direction. Though she's turned mostly toward the stove, one finger slowly rubbing the wistful genie of its edges. And then to be fair, I have to read a poem about my son. <laughs> And you've probably all done this, sent somebody a text, and then you think, oh, I just wrote a poem, right? So this is text to my son. I won't tell you who's reading I left early. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I left the poetry reading before he finished, passed through Old Navy on my way to the car, bought you a pair of plaid boxers, and your sister black socks patterned with gray birds and a splatter of hearts. It was raining. I came home and listened to the dark. So I teach art at an elementary school. And a couple years ago, there was a young man who was a substitute, and he was flirting with a girl at a local restaurant. And he would ask me to join him for lunch, and I think he just wanted support when he went <laughs> to flirt. <laughs> and, and so this just happened one day, and I wrote it down. <clears throat> it's titled Nesting Season for Chris. In a nested dent of metal awning swaying outside the library door, a wren is calling its mate. Flawless, she waits, toes curled on the rim of the garden gate before singing her reply. Later, when we met for lunch, you smelled of pine. I watched you flirt with the girl behind the counter while she smiled nervously, refolding perfectly folded napkins. <laughs> and then the day the Taliban shot Malala Yosafzai, I'd heard the news on the radio in the morning, and I went to school, and I didn't know how to function through the day. I just thought we should just bring everything to a stop, but you can't talk to little kids about this. So there was a huge storm building up over the mountains, and I took every class outside. That was the best I could do that day. Um, I, I had this note published in a, this letter poem, published in an anthology, and all the poems in the anthology, all the prophets went to Malala, which made me feel good. It's titled Note to the Taliban. I heard how you boarded a van, asked which girl was Malala then shot her in the head. All that day I gathered my classes outside to look at the sky, wanting to make sure children noticed enormous dark clouds stealing our view of the mountains while the sun's piercing light dazzled the mounting storm's edges, creating exquisite lines. We had to shield our eyes. I saw this ad in the Independent, and I just rolled my eyes and wrote this poem. 
<clears throat> it's titled Caught by a Camera in Cultural Crossroads. A dozen Mexican girls stand tense, each in an aproned Danish dress, identical braids and forced smiles in a photograph above the text, eager to serve you. All this to advertise free Kringles next Saturday on the 25th anniversary of a landmark Danish bakery. And I could stand here probably for two hours and talk about the background story to this poem, but I know Phil won't let me do that. <laughs> um, but let me just tell you that what I learned from this experience is that parents can do almost anything with their children as long as that child doesn't end up in the emergency room with physical damage. Other kinds of damage, the county can't step in. Drove me crazy. This is titled, Dear Peter. When your coach muttered, He'll kill someone when he's older. I replied, or himself, or his mother, and we see it and tried, but nothing we do seems to matter. Several hours and agencies later, I filed another report. Your diet of frozen pizza, matted hair, thin skin and bones, eyes fixed on a tablet computer, expressionless when your mother screams in your face or spins you in giddy circles. Hours you spend alone in motel rooms while she gambles at the casino and your house a hoarder's haven, paths pushed between boxes, tilting trash packed to the ceiling. Months ago your mother, no threat to herself or others, peeked through the door, stepped outside, fed the social workers lies. They've asked me for photos of your home's interior. Wish me luck, Peter. I'll have to break and enter. I don't speak Spanish, but this has a Spanish title. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a Vista del Polvo de Estrella. The retirement complex shines like a science fiction movie set in the scene just before the apocalypse. Perfect lawns, shrubs at their prime, no cobwebs, no dust, no honking horns, no noise, only penetrating silence. In my friend's white, bright windowed suite, she tells of her neighbor's past, teaching in Istanbul, climbing Mount Everest, unfolding tales of lives left behind, gravity blurring lines down to one small carry-on. They patiently wait for the boarding call, curious to learn whose turn to ride that last blinding flash into stardust. And then Enid said I could read some poems <laughs> just for myself. <laughs> and so this is one of, I think, one of the best poems I've written, but um, it's called Gardening for My Brother, and he died when he was 13 and I was 19, and I was very close to him, so it was really hard. <clears throat> the morning sun rests on my shoulders as I bend in a row of white flowers plucking wilted blossoms, thinking of you, more than 40 years since you faded in a bed of fresh white sheets and pillows. When I'm even less than what comes after scattered ashes, you'll still matter. And so I get to read this for myself, too, and I think some of you have heard this before, but it's a very redemptive poem, and it's titled Best Man. The online survey asked, if you knew your fetus had Down syndrome, would you have an abortion? Time passed as I stared at the screen, considering my brother. Yet if I wanted to know results of the poll, they required my vote. Earlier at the grocery store, I'd recognized my clerk as the personal aide to Tom, a man with Down syndrome I'd met at the gym. Hey, he smiled, how you been? I asked if he took, still took care of his friend, to which he beamed, oh yeah, he was just best man at my wedding. Check outlines slowed to a halt as details came streaming out. How his brother has a beautiful Brazilian girlfriend, and all through the vows, Tom kept elbowing him, whispering, 
who is that? Who is that? <laughs> How Tom managed to appear in every portrait of the newly married couple. And looking at the photos, the bride smiled. It looks like you married him. <laughs> he concluded, Tom even got a little drunk. But how would you know, I grinned. His tie was loosened and his cheeks were red. <laughs> so these are four poems in 25, each one 25 words or less. <clears throat> To the, to the overly groomed couple in cowboy hats, balanced on bar stools, drunk on their ass, watching their middle-aged transgender son or daughter sing karaoke, I applaud you. The gravity of our situation. Struggling to escape your dazzling orbit, I am helpless as the tide. Can this marriage be saved? He holds the light while she digs her own grave. Near the water's edge, who decides when seagulls rise, their pop and snap of pressing wings, a celebration? And now my poem's about nature. My poems are short, and so time goes quickly. <laughs> Today's news and weather. Trees toss, content in the force of elements. Cars and boats float in a tsunami. News so fresh, it streams faster than the studio tech can insert a meaningful soundtrack. Then your letter waltzes in, a symphony on berry season. Your stained hands straining for the shaded cluster, balancing with one arm pressed against a wooden fence. While outside my window, a crow, apparently in audition for the role of night watchman, struts, indifferent to roiling events, unable to do anything but play his part to perfection. And Enid co-published an anthology on crows titled A Bird Black as the Sun, and my poem got in it. <laughs> it's, it's titled The Crow's Calling. A bird moved as if a black hole shaped like a crow was strutting a path across the bright playground grass before rising leisurely at an angle to observe from the perch of a stark eucalyptus, to call forth a sermon, determined, inspired as a priest on a foreign mission, ignoring the fact of our language difference. Fortitude, and fortitude is the strength to meet danger, pain, and hardship with courage. Are you listening, John? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a little bird no bigger than a gulp flew without fear or forethought smack into my window. Its thump the sound of death carving another victory notch. The splatter recorded every feather, printed on glass, its beak and eye from the side, shoulder twisted, awkward as a petroglyph. It hurled to the ground as I ran to the rescue, only to watch it wobble, stand, shudder, and hop into the brush. I brought this poem because of you, John, because I know you're a painter. You're welcome. I don't know where I want to say things in there. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Notes for an oil painting. Driving south to LA, colors fade as shifting light drenches the landscape. Green recedes into shadows. Rounding a curve, blurred tail lights define the side of a mountain. A silver train tilting strains the track, rumbling past. While the distant city's glow flattens hills into silhouettes as we speed into night's dark palette. <laughs> so I, I'm kind of interested in bees and, and I jog and I notice that when 
you come upon a tree or a plant that has bees in it, it, it always makes this, it's making the same sound, right? And I don't know much about music, but I started to wonder if that sound that bees make could also be a musical note. And I was taking a bee class last spring, and so I asked the beekeeper that question, and he said, yes, it is. And coincidentally, it's the bee below middle C. Yeah, it's the note of B. <laughs> and so this is called B journal notation. Buoyant from pistol to anther, intent in their quest for nectar and pollen, wings sing the note of B through a jungle of white grapefruit blossoms, then suddenly stop, arrested by the dark sweep of a crow's shadow. And this is my last poem, but I have a quote afterwards. This is titled, while, this is probably more than 25 words, while sitting in my car at the Fairview intersection waiting for the light to change. <laughs> this would take an eternity, so I downed the windows, up the music, and a bee landed on my wrist, pressed her proboscis against my flesh, and pivoted in a circle, then strolled a few steps, repeating this pattern up my arm with exquisite precision, curious perhaps that such a dry desert could still emit the smallest whiff of potential. <laughs> I credit my body lotion. <laughs> when she flew down the V of my shirt, I prayed the, right, the light remain red. She stopped to rest before hiking back up, crossing my neck and snuggling behind my right ear. Suddenly, she was out the window, stinging me with regret. And so my quote in closing is from Wendell Berry, who said in a poem, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Thank you. Dressed and I went west toward the shore. Rain started pouring when I stepped on my skateboard. Got all my dreams and duct taped at the seams. And all my reasons seemed to be believed in. But when by the building, it's gonna be the breeze through the trees now. Everybody separates to find the unity somehow. Oh, you know them thieves didn't steal a thing. But they led you to the edge and watched you fall on in. You're too busy worried about something. That you got no business in And every child needs an escape I hope it's not lies, I hope it's not hate Got you hooked on a video game Nothing better than I'm that brain Some got no better role models Than the president who's a thief on a throne And the cops are the king of the world
for some reason I, I worry day and night about water. I have a farm with trees, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not making enough art about water. So this piece is about water, but it does a much deeper kind of a emotional, historical meaning, you know. This piece is called She Crossed the River. And the river is, uh, stands for two things, as a matter of fact. One is uh, the Atlantic River, which my mother crossed as a very young woman, escaping Europe from the horrors of uh, Nazism. Uh, so she crossed the river. She also brought with her, and that was pretty amazing to me as a young child, a little box full with buttons that were very pretty. It also means for me, probably because I'm from South America and I'm an immigrant three times. <laughs> so it, it, it talks to me about crossing the Rio Grande. All the thousands or millions of women that cross the river again to, to a place where they can uh, be respected or have a life or be able to eat and feed their families. So this uh, is what brought me to, to uh, tell that story. First, there was stone. What if I told you my religion was a stone in the sky following me? from the first rock that spoke in childhood. Cloister heavy, the moon mute over my shoulder, leading me to wander so that now, closer to the end, I don't really know if this was Stone's kindness or trickery. Thank you. 
When I think of water, I think of blessing. I think of cleansing and forgiveness. I think of tears. I think of the creases around your eyes as you told me for the last time that you loved me. And I know there's more to water than that. When I think of water, I think of hopping from stone to stone as I made my way wobblingly across a creek. My father is coaxing an outstretched hand, buoying me to him in the hope that I could hold that hand, in the hope that I could be close to him, be enveloped by his acceptance, if only until the next minute. When I think of water, I think of long Sonoma winters, weighed down with moisture, damp months when, where I, the water child, got saturated to overflowing, and your sourpuss face as you cursed existence and grumbled to yourself. How you made me smile, made me forget the damp, the perpetual chill, and rest instead in the warmth of your eyes when you laughed. Water makes me think of you laughing. When I think of water, I think of that half-frozen waterfall where I first walked with love. How it looked more like a photograph stilled in time that day than anything real. The way you took my hand, nodded with wide eyes and a smile, saying, without words, isn't that something? And it was. When I think of water, I think of you dressed in kittens, of you, my dear, dear friend, and how what spans the space between us is something incredibly simple and undoubtedly complex, and how it sometimes feels so liquid that I think I can go back in time, back to that smile, to that hand in mine. Sometimes it seems like the only answer. Then I breathe, take a sip, and step forward. Thank you.